Hello, and welcome to the Numbers of Thoth, brought to you by Julia and Martin Herdman. If you love ancient Egypt, and you want to understand more about this once great civilization, stick around. Today, we're going for a deep dive into a fascinating piece of Tutankhamun's treasure. Although nearly 5,400 objects accompanied the young pharaoh, on his journey to the afterlife, many have not been investigated in detail. In 1922, British Egyptologist, Howard Carter, discovered the burial chamber of the boy King Tutankhamun, in the Valley of the Kings. Among the vast hoard of golden treasure, he found a mysterious and miraculously preserved iron dagger. Where the dagger had come from was a puzzle. It was a puzzle, because, although ancient Egypt is often portrayed as an advanced civilization, by alternative archaeologists, iron was not used in Egypt, at the time of King Tut's reign. In fact, the ancient Egyptians were latecomers to the Age of Iron. It was the Hittites, an Indo-European people, from what is now central Turkey, who pioneered the use of iron sometime between 1400 and 1500 BC. By contrast, the Iron Age in Egypt began between 1200 and 1000 BC, and iron was not in regular use until about 500 BC. However, Egypt's late uptake of iron does not mean that iron objects do not appear in the archaeological record from the very earliest times. This is because both the Hittites and the Egyptians had mastered the art, or perhaps more correctly the science, of smelting meteoric iron. In graves dating to the Nakada III period, that is, around 3200 to 300 BC, to the second half of the first century BC, small items such as iron beads and other trinkets made of iron have been found in high-status burials. In fact, Tutankhamun was buried with several iron items. A set of small iron chisels set into wooden handles, an iron eye of Horus amulet, and a miniature headrest made of iron, in addition to his iron dagger. The Bronze Age Hittites experimented with developing iron weapons, while they never equipped their whole army with iron weapons, they seem to have developed superior arms for their elite troops using advances in metallurgy. Just how much iron they had is a mystery, as until about 750 BC, the scarcity of written records means it is difficult to be confident about how military operations were conducted. Nevertheless, we know that by the second millennium BC, the armies of the Bronze Age, Middle East, were primarily made up of cavalry and charioteers, supported by regiments of semi-trained foot soldiers, armed with bows, slings, clubs, or spears. Most of these weapons were made of bronze. And body armor, if it was worn at all, was made from leather, wicker, wood, or quilted cloth. Making iron from ore was known to the Hittites. But it was not made in quantity, because it was too arduous and expensive to give good iron to everyone. So, it was reserved for their elite warriors. Their very best iron was produced in small amounts, from pure nodules of meteoric iron. This iron from the sky was referred to as, the black iron of heaven. The word black, indicates that the meteorite nodules were collected soon after a meteor shower, as the black fusion crust is rapidly destroyed by weathering and replaced by a layer of red-brown rust if left in the open. So, it is possible foraging parties were sent out after meteor showers, to retrieve the precious lumps of extraterrestrial rock. Items made with this rare, and magical material were reserved for kings, and men of high rank in Hittite society, and were given as high-class gifts to foreign rulers. And indeed, this seems to be the origin of Tutankhamun's iron knife. A list of gifts in the Amarna letters, a tranche of diplomatic correspondence, written on clay tablets, between 1360 and 1332 BC, tells of favors sent by King Tushrata of Mitanni, in Anatolia. To the Egyptian pharaoh, Amenhot III, Tutankhamun's grandfather. Amazingly, this letter records the gift of an iron dagger, given on the occasion of the marriage of Princess Tardu Keeper, the daughter of Tushrata, to Amenhotep. 
After the death of Amenhotep, Tadahipa was married to his son Akhenaten, to Tankamun's father. And it seems the dagger, being such a precious item, was passed on to Akhenaten, who, upon his own death, passed it on to his son, Tutankhamun. So, the dagger found by Carter was a precious family heirloom. The knife is a roughly polished double-edged blade with a gold and jewel-encrusted hilt. It is 34.2 cm long and has a prominent, sinuous crack that runs along its center. It was found in the king's burial wrappings resting against his right thigh. A recent study by a group of Japanese and Egyptian researchers at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo has shed new light on this mysterious dagger. Thanks to non-destructive chemical analysis, the team has determined that the dagger was made from the most common class of iron meteorites. They also discovered that the weapon was manufactured using low-temperature forging in Anatolia, confirming its Hittite origin. In his excavation notes, Howard Carter describes the dagger's haft as made of granulated gold, embellished at intervals with collars of cloisonné work of colored stones, and surmounted with a knob of turned rock crystal. Although pitted with a few spots of rust, the iron blade is still bright and sharp. Looking at the blade in more detail, we can see it carries no decoration or incisions, but the handle or haft, as Carter describes it, is richly incised with zigzag motifs realized in gold. Between these lines of gold are geometrical and floral inlays made of colored glass and semi-precious stones. The sheath was made from a single sheet of pure gold. On one side it is embossed with a feathered, rishi pattern. On the other side, it is embossed with a palmette and rope pattern. Egyptologists have offered several explanations for the use of these motifs. The palmette design is not exclusive to the Hittites, it was used by the ancient Egyptians and other civilizations across the eastern Mediterranean, but in a Hittite context. It could be interpreted as a design based on the date palm, a sacred tree used in Hittite purification rituals. Hittite texts recount one such purification ritual to cure the sick. It was to be performed at night before the sun rises. The process began with bathing and shaving. After the first ritual bath, the head of the patient was shaved by a barber, who removed the hair from their armpits and the left side of their body. The toes and fingernails of their left hand and foot were then trimmed and placed in a bowl of unfired clay. The bowl was then placed in a circle of flour. The next stage was another bath followed by ritual anointing with sacred oil. The patient was then dressed in a new garment from the left side. Once dressed, the priest placed the branch of a date palm on the front of the patient's head, binding it three times. The same process was then performed on the patient's right hand and right foot to drive away whatever was ailing them. The date palm was also used in the Hittite ritual of Zarpia, which was practiced against epidemics. In this ritual, a date palm was hung on the door peg to protect the house. So, the date palm was a crucial part of Hittite purification rituals. Such purification rituals focus on the pursuit of good health and wellness and are necessary for cleansing when there has been some kind of polluting contact, such as contact with a corpse, or contact with the demonic forces, or agents of black magic. Purification rites were also required to gain the gods' blessings before undertaking a significant endeavor, and were always required before any contact with the sacred. So, if we accept or suppose the decoration of Tutankhamun's iron dagger is based on Hittite, and not Egyptian, mythology, it could be interpreted as an eternally sharp, purifying weapon for eliminating evil and corruption. In which case, the knife was perhaps placed at the king's right-hand side for him to kill the evil snake Apophis, or any underworld demons, he might encounter, on his journey to the afterlife. It may have even been placed there by the embalmers to enable the king to protect himself against his archenemy, the god of chaos, Seth. Alternatively, of course, it may have simply been placed there as a reminder or connection with his family, 
particularly his father Akhenaten, and his grandfather, Amenhope III. If you have enjoyed this video and want to find out more about ancient Egypt, its treasures, myths and religion, then please hit the like button. And don't forget to subscribe, so that you never have to miss an issue. See you next time for another deep dive into the fantastic world of ancient Egypt. Until then, thank you for listening.